Diplomats, school us. Tournaments, fuel us. And AIs, fool us. I'm David Hood of the Diplomacy Broadcast Network, and this is Deadline, DBN's monthly news program. Dateline, May 2024. For our feature story, the summer diplomacy convention season is now upon us. In addition to a number of events coming up at general gaming conventions and the World DipCon in Italy at the end of May and the 38th annual DixieCon over Memorial Day weekend, all of which we've mentioned in previous programs, there are several North American Diplomacy Federation events coming up in the next several months so that folk in that North American region can know more about their con options Later in the program, we'll have a panel discussion with the directors of three summer face-to-face -face tournaments in this next installment of our news segment we call Where to Play. But first, a look at headlines from around the world of diplomacy. The fine folks at DiploStrats are back with new YouTube content about diplomacy, so buckle your seatbelts and prepare to consume. First up, they released a video analyzing one of the semifinal games from the Olympus Extended Deadline Tournament on Backstabber. The game is called Artemis. Captain Meme and his co-analyst Ezio do a deep dive into that game. And then a week later, the channel provided yet another detailed analysis of a single game. In this case, a game played by YouTuber Veilfisk, who actually used ChatGPT to determine his moves in the game. Yes, computer-assisted hijinks ensued. In between these two extended length videos, the Diplostrats guys also released one of their Diplo Shorts series, this one with the charming title of Convoys Are Weird. Are you intrigued? Well, you should be. So use the link below to peruse the videos available at the Diplostrats YouTube channel. While we're on the subject of the Olympus community's primary tournament, which is currently in the midst of its top board on the second season, such a momentous event shall not go into this good night unanalyzed. Ed Sullivan and his team at the Diplomats, I'm sorry, the Diplomats YouTube channel are providing their usual keen commentary on every single season of the game, looking into every nook and cranny, inside every seat cushion, and underneath every turned stone to provide excellent content for you, the viewing audience. This main event final features Riaz Varani in England. Volpes as Germany, Jordan Connors in France, Greg Matthews as the Italian, the Austria of Lare, and Bradley Grace in Turkey, along with the Russian played by John Ostrowski. As I write this, the commentators are looking at the spring 1903 moves, where Germany has had been the on man out in the West, but Jordan has now sent fleets north against Riaz. While in the East, the AR has just turned on its partner Turkey instead of continuing Austria's offensive against Italy. The twists and turns of this game will likely just keep coming. So check out the link below to subscribe to the Diplomats channel so you won't miss any of the fun. In face-to-face -to -face tournament news, the Netherlands Diplomacy Association has announced the return of the Dutch Championship event to be held this 2nd and 3rd of November at the Lust restaurant in Groningen. There will be three rounds of diplomacy over that Saturday and Sunday using the C-Diplo scoring system, with games to end after fall 1907, if not before then. This will be the first time the Netherlands has held its national championship since 2019. So tournament director Yelta Kuyper and team are excited to bring back this event to the European circuit. Now, while we're talking Europe, we should talk European diplomacy championship, right? We should. On September 13 through 15, the annual EDC will this year be held in Sion, Switzerland, which was also the site of the 2020 EDC. Four rounds will be played over the three days, along with open gaming at a board gaming bar that Friday morning and a common meal to be served with a Haitian theme during the convention. Also, this event is part of the Tour de France of Diplomacy, as detailed in the link below. Finally, the annual diplomacy event at the general gaming convention known as Origins is scheduled this year for June 19 through 23 in Columbus, Ohio. The diplomacy event will be under the capable leadership of Thomas Haver as per usual. I have provided a link to that event below, along with all the others mentioned here and later 
to be mentioned in the panel discussion. Let's turn now to the subject of virtual face-to-face -face leagues, where I'm happy to report that things are really hopping this spring. The Virtual Diplomacy League just hosted its May game day, with a record seven virtual face-to-face -face games being played over that three rounds on May the 11th. There were new players galore, along with many tested veterans as well. Highlights included an Italian solo, as well as two board tops from DBN personality Ben Kelman playing as Austria in one game and Turkey in the other. You can catch the full coverage of all seven games using the link to DBN's League Night program, which recorded live commentary on each game. The Tour of Britain League also continues its 2024 season with round three of its eight-round format to be played at 6 p.m. local time on May 25th. You need not have played in previous rounds in order to participate, so navigate to the VWDC Discord server and look at the Tour of Britain role for more information. Micah Bloom is currently leading the Tour of Britain, and this Dutch player was also leading the VDL until this past game day when she was relegated to third position behind Justin Lohr, the guy who got the Italian solo, and Ben Kelman. Now in Australia, the Snake Pit League is still also going strong with games to be featured in a future episode of League Night here on DBN. So I've provided a link below to the Snake Pit Discord server. And again, last but not least, also running is the Seven Years War League based in Europe, which rotates virtual games in Dutch, English, German, and French. Visit the VWDC Discord server, go to the general chat, and ask for help to get into the Seven Years War. Every month, we like to report on the latest and greatest audio, video, or visual content from creators we call our DBN Media Partners. This month, we look specifically at visual content, i.e. the written word. The latest edition of the emailed diplomacy magazine called God Save the Zine, which is issue 15, hit the hobby's inboxes in late April. Longtime hobbyist Stephen Agar of the UK produced his usual fanish bonanza of hobby news diplomacy history, and focus on variants, in addition to running a number of games for his subscribers, including not only diplomacy and its variants, but also a diplomacy bourse, sop with, and other games. One item of interest in this issue is a survey of British diplomacy variants focused on the Dark Ages, including a full repent of the Excalibur variant set in approximately 500 AD. There is a link to his website below, which you can use to subscribe to his zine. Also, let me literally tell you, there is physical media still being received by me in the U.S. mail, in this case from Australia. Zine publisher Brendan White still sends his zine the old-fashioned way by airmail. Issue 235 of his Damn the Consequences zine includes a very lively letter column, Brendan's own writing about hobby history and his recent trip to Chicago, and game reports from a number of different uh, games, including Robo Rally. Pandemic, and Railway Rivals. Now, as far as diplomacy is concerned, Brendan has openings not only for the classic game, but also for the variant Napoleonic and the commercially published variant Machiavelli. To subscribe to his zine, contact him at Obi-Wan5, and one has an O in it, Obi-Wan5 at Hotmail.com. Looking to fill about five and a half hours of your life with quality content covering the newest event on the Diplomacy Spring? Do I have an answer for you? It's called the Diplomacy Broadcast Network's coverage of the inaugural running of the Hung Parliament Handicap. This was a face-to-face -face tournament held in Canberra, Australia, back in April. Tournament director Jamal Blakarli created a tournament structure designed to ease newcomers and less experienced players into a competitive environment with more experienced players, plus some outright sharks, folks. By all accounts, this experiment was a resounding success. DBN's coverage features network co-founder Brandon Fogel hosting a bevy of commentators, including 2023 North American champ Nicholas Camarites of the UK, 2021 DixieCon winner Karthik Conneth from California, and the host of DBN's back channel, Texan Ed Sullivan. Watch as the Aussie hobby celebrates the return of tournament diplomacy to its national capital. And we all get another opportunity to observe dip players experience both the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. You can find a link to this broadcast in the show notes below. 
Many times here on Deadline, I have reported to you about Meta's AI agent called Cicero and how it was able to win an online blitz diplomacy tournament a year or two ago. We've also featured interviews here with some of those involved in the development of Cicero and reported on academic papers centered on the use of diplomacy, frankly, for decades in the development of artificial intelligence more generally. Now we have a recent article authored by a number of scholars from MIT and the Australian Catholic University, which argue that advances in artificial intelligence now allow for the deception of humans by machines. The piece, which is entitled AI Deception, a survey of examples, risk, and potential solutions, actually uses Cicero playing diplomacy as an example, warning that despite Meta's assertion that it taught the AI to play diplomacy largely without deception, the machine ends up performing deceptively in any event. Here's a quote. If it not only betrayed other players, but also engaged in premeditated deception, planning in advance to build a fake alliance with a human player in order to trick that player into leaving themselves undefended for an attack, end quote. Noam Brown, just what have you done? You can read the full article using the link below it in the show notes. And now let's enjoy the latest installment of our continuing series of human interest stories we call My Favorite Things. In this segment, we welcome to the show a diplomacy personality to talk about a personal passion of theirs, whether or not related to diplomacy. This month, we talk to DBN co-founder and Chicago's Windy City Weasels member, Brian Pravel, about the journey that he and his wife have embarked upon into the wonderful world of foster parenting. Brian, thanks for joining us here on Deadline. Thank you, David. Happy to be here. Great. All right. Many folks have heard your backstory, you know, that you started playing diplomacy as a family activity. Tell us a little bit about that, if you would elaborate on it. Yeah. I mean, diplomacy is basically in my blood. We, uh, my, my parents were introduced to the game uh, during a hurricane and the subsequent flooding uh, in the late 70s when they were students at the University of Houston. And uh, a, a friend of theirs brought out a game. He was like, hey, we have nothing else to do. I got a long game. Well, here's, here, this is perfect. So uh, mom stabbed dad. Dad was bitter. They had to be together, trapped in the house all weekend. And uh, they still enjoyed it and liked it so much. They got a copy uh, when I was eight. Uh, my dad had been teaching me like checkers and chess and uh, came across this game with a map that I just loved and these little pieces and dad showed me how you could write orders and then the pieces would do what you told them to. And that as an eight year old was just a magical experience to me. So we spent a lot of time just kind of doing um, like two, two person uh, variants. We'd attack the neutral countries and uh, just kind of learning mechanics and building and then uh, played my first full game at 10. And um, the, the rest is history. I've been, I've been, I got the bug as well. So did you play with family members, the, the actual negotiation part of the game, not just the tactics? Yeah. So 10 was the first time with negotiation. And then um, like it, it was my entire family. So like my extended family too. Uh, grandparents, aunts, uncles, uncle's girlfriend, like we would play probably three, four times a year at least. Uh, and then I'm oldest of seven. So as my siblings grew, that just made a larger pool of players. And uh, some some of us enjoyed the game more than others, obviously. Um, but with that core group uh, between family and friends, uh, we, we usually had at the most, I think at peak, we're probably playing a game a month. And uh, most of the time we played at least two to four times a year. So when you're playing with members of your family, how much do family dynamics enter into it versus oh. you know, just playing like a regular game? It, it, like every game, dad would get stabbed by mom and that was her victory condition number one. Like that's that's what mattered the most. And I, I have had some of the most fun convoys in my life where mom didn't care about anything except the fact that she was able to make this super long convoy by talking all the kids to convoying an army over to go attack dad. And it was great fun. 
Well, it sounds certainly sounds like it. Before we go any further, some folks might be interested to know what you do for a living. Tell us a little bit about that, if you would. Yeah, I'm the uh, technology officer for a healthcare system in Cook County. Uh, we work for Cook County Health. It's the largest um, emergency department in the United States uh, by volume. Uh, we've got Sturger Hospital. That's uh, the setting of the TV show ER. <laughs> that's the, or or the Fugitive. If you ever saw that, uh, that that's the hospital I work for. And uh, I've been in IT for uh, coming up on 25, almost, actually coming up on 30 years almost. And um, I, it just is really meaningful to me to have found work where we're contributing to care uh, as a safety net hospital for individuals who have nowhere else to turn to and to work for a system that has found a way to be able to uh, to do that and to do it in a cost-effective way and we're still getting quality scores that are um, like it's good care and we've got some amazing doctors and uh, it's just really rewarding to have that work and that job. Well that, that, that really does sound spectacular. Uh, well, we were talking about family dynamics earlier, and I've asked you here on dead, on the, on this particular part of Deadline, we call My Favorite Things, that's the segment. We're here to talk about something that's near and dear to your heart, which is foster parenting. So tell us about your family right now. Yeah, so um, I am uh, married to my wife, Katie. Uh, we got married three years ago, um, and uh, we're coming up on four, and we... Um, uh, ended up fostering uh, a few months before that. So I have uh, one six-year-old uh, foster son who lives with us. Well, uh, let's dive into that a little bit if we can. What led you and your wife into doing that? Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, that's part of why we're together. Uh, we uh, both went into this for different reasons. Um, we... Uh, Katie's always, uh, her, her family has always been very compassionate and caring and uh, been around other people that are like that. And so she was around a lot of other families that had non-traditional uh, family members, uh, whether through adoption or so, uh, fostering or some other kind of uh, scenario. And so in her mind, even at like five, six years old, she just felt like that was just a different way to have a family. So that was something she always wanted. Uh, and that was a goal she had in her life. Um, mine is more uh, of a, a medical thing. My, my uh, mom has muscular dystrophy and that's genetic. Um, I don't believe that I'm uh, even a carrier necessarily, but that gene can carry over. Um, so I just didn't want to pass that along. It's been a really, really rough um, time for my mom. She's completely invalid. And uh, so I just made a decision at a young age that I didn't want biological children, but family has always been very important to me. So uh, we both knew we wanted to, uh, we started looking into adoption and uh, I've kind of felt a little embarrassed about this at first, uh, but what led me into finding out about foster care was I was looking at the cost. And when the cost of adopting in the United States, it depends on where you're adopting from, et cetera, but somewhere between 15000 to $60,000 uh, per adoption. And then there was this other program called fostering where they pay you. I was like, what, what is going on? Like, and it's not much, but they, they pay for, to help support the children. And uh, so I just started looking like, why, what is it? And found this whole world that I just was completely ignorant about. Uh, so the foster program, the main difference is that with adoption, you have legal rights and you are a parent of that child. With foster care, I like to think of it as the child is a ward of the state and a foster parent is providing care to avoid the state having them live in like a group home kind of setting. So there are no legal rights as far as being a parent. You are a, a steward. And the mission of foster care is to be able to care for that child 
while the parent who had some kind of situation to put, like there was a traumatic situation for every child in foster care. They don't, they're removed from their home. The state has said it's unsafe for that child to be there. Uh, and in many cases, the parent is in, in often, often cases, they're a victim of some kind of abuse within their own life. And so the, the theory behind foster care is that you are providing care for that child to give them the best upbringing that they can while the parent is able to focus on getting the care they need with the goal of reunification. Um, that does not happen in the majority of cases. Uh, in Illinois, I believe it's only somewhere around 30 to 40 percent of children are reunited with their families. Uh, but for those that do, like that is what the mission of foster care is. And I kind of struggled with that at first. We really were not sure like, these children were abused. And I am trying to care for someone that is potentially putting them back into an environment where they may be abused um, or, or where they had been. Uh, but when we went through foster training, uh, every foster parent has mandatory training that you have to go through, uh, which is fabulous. I wish every parent got that opportunity. I learned so much from it. Uh, but one of the things that we learned is that um, in many cases, um, the, the success rate for post foster care children is significantly higher if they are able to be reunited back to their family. Um, there is all kinds of identity loss and um, in many cases, uh, uncertainty about basic psychological needs like safety and do I have shelter? Will I have food? Uh, that if you're moving, especially if you're moving from home to home to home, uh, that can create patterns where that will impact them for the rest of their life. So statistically, the best outcome is for that parent to get the help they need and for that reunification to take place. And uh, that was a hard thing to accept. But once I understood it, um, it was like a light bulb went off and I realized that there are hundreds of thousands of children in the foster care system that need care and homes. And like, it's, it's a very, very rough, difficult place for the foster family. It's hard, but it's way harder for those children. And so uh, we definitely kind of developed a, a passion for that. And we're, we couldn't be happier to have um, our six-year-old in our home. Uh, he's just been, he's been a delight. Well, that's, that's a wonderful thing to hear. I'm sure there were twists and turns in the process though. You know, tell us about that to the extent that you feel comfortable doing it or you think you can. Do yeah. It. I mean, there's, there's certain things that I, I'm legally allowed to say and things that I can't, but um, I think the, there's a few important things. Um, I, I think the most important thing is that you are not in this alone. And that was something that I didn't realize the value of until we had to live it. Um, but we like it, it, it's a it's a trope, but the it takes a village is very true. I think of any child, but it is particularly true for someone in foster care. And um, you have a team that comes with you. You have uh, a care a caseworker who is going to help check in uh, at regular intervals to make sure the child's getting the care they need, uh, but also to help with things like hey, here's a doctor, here's a, like, let me help you get a specialist. Um, our child is special needs. Uh, he's on autistic, he's nonverbal, and uh, he's got a very high level of, of specialized care that he needs. I would not, I, I work in the medical industry and I still would have struggled to try and work through the disability process and an individualized education program through school and all of these services. So that was invaluable. Um, and I'd say that's probably been the hardest part of this is just dealing with the, uh, the specialized care. The majority of kids in the foster system have some kind of special need. 
because of the abuse. Um, that abuse is a traumatic environment that w will cause brain damage of some sort. Um, even if it's not physical, um, it can cause psychological uh, damage. And so the majority of kids in care will need that uh, specialized attention and uh, to have somebody who can help you find those right resources and then get those children the care that they need is just so, so helpful and, and rewarding. Uh, the other big part of it is the legal system. Um, it's slow. Um, I, I will say that um, it has given me perspective though, <laughs> working at uh, where I work, I work for the county government of Cook County and uh, we are very also slow and bureaucratic. Um, by comparison to the legal system, we are blazing fast, but uh, it has definitely given me a, uh, an appreciation and a perspective. Um, one of the things that I've talked to my team about at work is uh, in many cases, bureaucracy. Uh, what that really is, is all of the burns and lessons learned and harm that has come to an organization over its history. Uh, there are, uh, systems that have been put in place to try and help protect against that. And uh, I always challenge my team to challenge, are those still appropriate and necessary? But in many cases they are. So can we accomplish that a better way? That kind of stuff. In the foster care system, uh, there are not enough people or there's more, there's more uh, need than there is capacity to provide care. And that's both on the care side and from a legal side. Um, and it's also a very slow process because they try to be very careful with their decisions. And I was frustrated by that at first, but over time I have come to appreciate it. Um, in our particular process, um, we are going to be adopting. Um, for that to happen, it requires a termination of parental rights. So in most cases, the parent is not going to willingly give up those rights. And so the state has to have a case saying it's not safe and it's in the best interest of the child to be placed somewhere else. And that's not a small decision. Uh, the majority of people um, that lose their parental rights are uh, minorities. Uh, they lose them at a much higher rate than people like myself. And uh, I don't think that that's right. So I do appreciate that there is an emphasis placed on um, allowing people to appeal decisions and being very slow, very methodical, and as frustrating as it has been, uh, we are three years into this process and still not done. Um, in, in Illinois, the average is about five years before a decision is made, either reunification or um, placement. Uh, I'm glad that it's that way because that means that we're taking the time to make a informed decision and to give parents a chance. Um, if it's a substance abuse example for, or, or uh, a reason that the child was removed from home, for example, um, like statistically your ability to recover from a, a chemical addiction, especially a severe one, it's not gonna happen in a year. Like that can take multiple years for your brain to rewire and heal in a way that you no longer have that addiction. So um, it was hard, but that uh, time is something that I, I do agree that that's the right approach. And so just learning to be patient um, has been uh, one of the main lessons that I've learned from this. And then also to just appreciate the support that we're getting uh, from our, our larger care team. Well, what about this process or this experience that you've had? What about it has surprised you the most? Um, I think the thing that has surprised me the most is that the um, people in that are in that care team have been so supportive. Uh, there is definitely a stereotype that I was expecting going into this of this bitter caseworker who's just seen it all and they don't care anymore and the judge or the like just this whole stereotype and uh, I, I won't say that every situation will be like ours but that is definitely not the experience that I've had. 
they are overworked. Uh, they work so many hours, like 60, 70, 80 hours a week. They're responding to stuff at all hours of the day and they make like $30,000 a year. Like it, they get paid nothing for it. And it's because they do it out of this passion that they have to provide this care. Uh, my, uh, my foster son has a government assigned a liaison that's basically his legal representative um, has just been fantastic to work with. Has such a heart for these children. Uh, I mean, she's a lawyer. She could make way more money doing something else. And she is choosing to spend her time to help with these children. So just to be around all of these people that are overworked and underpaid, but have such a passion for caring for these children, uh, th that's been the biggest surprise. Well, just hearing you talk, I'm, I know I'm feeling, I'm sure some other people who are watching this will be feeling some questions in their minds about sort of how you do this. It seems like it would be unpredictable, uh, emotionally draining, lots of things that would, that would be quite a challenge to go through. What do you say to that? Um, first, I would say I am making an assumption here because I've never had biological children, but I'm assuming that just parenting in general has some of those ups and downs and challenges. You are making a correct assumption. Yeah. So I think that um, there is an element of this is a you have all of that plus. <laughs> um, but with that plus, you also have some support that you wouldn't have otherwise. So it's, um, it's, it's hard for me to do a, a comparison or say what's easier or not. But what I can say is that patience is necessary. Um, there is much that is outside of your control and you just have to be comfortable recognizing that you are doing the absolute best that you can for the child that is in your care. Um, I would say do not enter into this lightly. I would say that for parenting also, but um, this is a choice that you're going to make and there's a lot of time and preparation that goes into it. Our licensing process probably took somewhere around nine months just in and of itself. Uh, you will have plenty of time to go through education. There was a moment when we were in class where Katie and I just looked at each other and we're like, I don't know if we can do this. It was overwhelming. And then it re I realized we just learned about all of the traumas, like all of the different problems. And that's not what you're going to have. You're going to have some of the traumas. And I believe that you, uh, if you go into it expecting that you're going to have uh, behavioral challenges, you're going to have health challenges, you're going to have more trips to the doctor that you ever would want to. And then, oh, by the way, you also have to do all the documentation because this is a legal case. So if you forget to dot the I and cross the T, now you're jeopardizing the case. Uh, so like that kind of stuff, if you go in expecting that, um, then I think when you get into it, you're going to be fine. Uh, I genuinely believe that no parent knows what they're doing. I think every child is different. Every child has their own needs. There is not a right way to do things. And I don't think there's a right way to address this situation. It's just a different set of problems. And if you're patient and you work together, um, I, I have, I could not do this without Katie on my side at my side and without uh, a supportive family uh, that I actually, I'm going to put a pin in everything I just said. And I'm going to say the most important thing is to have a support system behind you. Uh, a family system, teachers, church, friends, whatever that looks like in your life, um, you have to have that because you cannot do it on your own. Was there ever a concern going through this process, which is, I mean, it sounds like it's not just time consuming, but sort of all consuming. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a 
time that you're aware of, I'm, I'm, I'm investing a lot into this. What if it doesn't turn out the way I want it to? Absolutely. Um, that happened to me a couple, a couple times. One, um, I don't know what my son's child or development is going to be like. Um, my wife's brother is also nonverbal and autistic. So we went into this with some familiarity. Um, he still lives at home. He requires care at in his mid thirties. Um, there is a very real possibility that I may have a situation like that. I don't know. It could also be that he develops and is able to have a healthy, independent life. We, we have no idea, but I did have to accept like, <laughs> what the heck am I doing? I'm in my forties and I'm going to probably, I, there's a, a better chance than many that I will have a, uh, somebody that I'm going to be caring for until I am no longer able to do that. Uh, so yeah, that was a, what am I doing? Um, the other thing that's been hard is uh, we are a, a multiracial family. And so I do have some, I, it, it's, there's a lot of challenges that come from that. And uh, how do I help him identify as uh, a young black man? And when I get into, um, when, when he gets older, uh, like when we're looking in the criminal justice system, like so many of our children uh, are, are, are black children, especially black autistic children um, are entering into the juvenile system at a much higher rate or then into the criminal system at a much higher rate. Um, am, am I going to have racial profiling? How do I have that kind of conversation with, with my son that I've, never experienced that in my life. Um, and I'm fortunate that we have friends that have said, hey, we're here for you. We will have that conversation. Uh, we are trying to make sure that we can get him connected to a community and friends that uh, look like him and he has that identity. And then we're also fortunate that we've developed friends within the foster program. And uh, so he not only has friends that um, from from like other that racial perspective, but also a shared life experience. And I'm really hoping that we'll be able to maintain that relationship as well, because I, I think that's going to be very important. It sounds like it really goes back to what you said earlier about having a support system. And in this particular case, on multiple levels, it sounds like. Absolutely. Well, uh, I don't want to, this, this is not a commercial for somebody to be convinced that they should try this, but I, I think it would be interesting for you to tell our viewers what would make a good foster parent from your point of view, or what would be uh, reasons why people really can do it, even if they don't think they can, you know, wh yeah. however you want to answer that question. Um, like the game of diplomacy, fostering is not for everyone but it is extremely rewarding for those that make that choice would be my pitch to a diplomacy community. Um, it is not easy. It is long. Uh, there are ups and downs. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm stabbed in the back, uh, but I get so much joy from watching the difference that I have had and have been able to make uh, in the life of my child. Uh, he came in to care malnourished, undersized. Um, he would only eat like crispy cereal and, and uh, just no nothing healthy. Now little guy loves healthy food and sushi and <laughs> he just, he's grown, he's healthy, he's active, he's thriving in school. Uh, he's not able to to speak, but he's learning how to communicate in other ways. Uh, and that experience has just been amazing to watch. And he brings so much joy uh, into my own life. And people often say to me, like, hey, it's really, like, it's amazing what you and Katie are doing. And he's so lucky to have you. And that's true. 
like the, it, we, he would be much worse off if we were not there for him. Uh, but we are also lucky to have him in our life. And uh, that, that joy, uh, I, I can't even put into words what that uh, experience is like. And um, if, if you are a patient person, if you are a compassionate person, and you are willing to, and you have the support system behind you, and you're willing to realize that so many people in this uh, situation uh, are there because of systemic issues, and you are just trying to help provide support while some of those issues are addressed. You can't help everyone, but you can help someone. And that is a powerful, powerful thing to be able to do. Gosh, it certainly sounds like it. Any other final thoughts for our audience here? Uh, well, the it, good news for us, it's it's bittersweet uh, because there's always loss with this, uh, but our uh, case is nearing an end. Uh, we signed adoption paperwork, so we're just waiting on a court date and we will be no longer in foster care probably within the next eight weeks or so. So we are really excited to finalize that adoption and have our little one with us uh, for the rest of our lives. Well, congratulations on that, Brian. And thank you so much for talking to us about this, I would say, extremely important topic. Thank you, David. I appreciate you very much. And now it's time for a segment on our show we call Where to Play. In it, we profile a face-to-face, virtual face-to-face, or online diplomacy playing venue so that our deadline audience members have the information needed to expand their DIP horizons and to embrace new DIP opportunities. This month, we focus on three upcoming NADF face-to-face cons by talking to their tournament directors. Manus Hand, representing the Regatta event in Boulder, Colorado. Craig Mayer about his SkyCon in Montana and the 2024 running of the Boston Massacre to be discussed by GM Alex Maslow. Well, welcome back to Deadline, everyone. Let's start with you, Monasand. Tell us a little about your diplomacy origin story, and then give us some details about the when and the where of your upcoming event. Okay. Um, My origin goes back to long before most of the viewers were even born. My first diplomacy game was 1979, I think. And then after getting out of uh, school where we have six players to play with, I lost touch with the game for quite a while, and there was really no way to get back in touch because this was before anything like email ever came along. When email came along, I picked the game back up, found out I could play with people across the country or around the world, and was instantly addicted and into the world of diplomacy. I created the diplomatic pouch, which is what I'm probably most known for by everybody watching this. The DP judge was uh, the judge I created along with the pouch. I created a couple of variants and then I started traveling and became a tournament organizer before I had to take time off to attend to my kids. And I'm back Mm -hmm. now. So one of the things I'm doing now is the event you want me to talk about, which is July 19 through 21 here in Denver, actually in Boulder, which is Denver, Boulder area. Um, 19 through 21st of July on the Colorado University campus. We have a nice campus building that we're going to take over. Uh, There's hotels there, and we're going to have three rounds of diplomacy, a welcome dinner. We have a cookout, some free burgers and brats, silent auction, uh, board raffles. We always have a lecturer to talk about something. Diplomat, diplomacy related, uh, the cost is only $20. You can uh, register online at armada-dip.com slash 2024. And, oh, and we're the first, actually the second event in uh, awarding the Buzz Cup, which is for uh, the West Coast and the Mountain Area um, events. And I think we can talk a little bit more about that later with some of these other guys. But yeah, we're hoping to see a lot of people in, in July here in Denver, Boulder. All right. Sounds good. Alex, how about you, please? Tell us about your diplomacy journey and then about your Boston massacre. Thanks, David. 
it's really fitting that we're talking right around Mother's Day because it was actually my mom who got me into diplomacy. In middle school, she really insisted that I join an after uh, an after school club, and I was a history teacher who ran a diplomacy club. So that's what I joined. Fast forward ugh, 24 years, and here I am now organizing the Boston Hobby and the upcoming tournament, Boston Massacre. Thanks, mom. Um, but Boston Massacre. So it's a great little tournament. It's actually run in Cambridge, to be technical. Uh, it's at a local gaming store with a great basement location, a great area down there to go around and negotiate. Uh, it's one game per day, and we do a bunch of socializing before and after the games. This year, actually, I'm trying to organize a trip to the old state house, which is the site of the actual Boston Massacre. Well, I, I, I prefer to think of this as the actual Boston Massacre and the other thing <laughs> as the other thing. So I'm just, just speaking for myself. That's the way I look at it. Um, all right, Craig, we're about to see the second Sky Con. So tell us about your dip origin story and then about your con itself. Well, like Manus, I think my origin story starts well before most viewers were born, probably in the early to mid 80s. Um, yeah, I agree that both of you are old. But you know. <laughs> I grew up in a I grew up in a very little tiny town and they had a free public library on every Saturday morning. They had a board game group that met and I would go and play and they always had a group that would play diplomacy there and we were not allowed to play with them unless they absolutely needed a player. And if they needed a player, they would let one of the younger guys there step in and play and they'd always give us Austria and they would always kill us immediately. And I have kept that tradition going. <laughs> you, um, do, you do play a mean Austria. Yeah. And I, I get, yeah. And people are mean, people are mean. <laughs> Um, so then, uh, you know, like, like Manus, I kind of, I kind of fell out of it for a very, very long time. And then in the like 2010 somewhere, I started playing online a little bit. And then in 2016, I started attending, um, face-to-face -face tournaments. And my very first tournament was Boston Massacre. That's, that's a great connection. All right, Craig, let's stay with you. Oh, and Tell us, what is your most important objective in terms of hosting SkyCon? So SkyCon, this will be the second SkyCon, like um, David mentioned. And the first one was five years ago, because about five years ago, we were walking into a pandemic. And then there were some other personal things I had to deal with that prevented me from being able to run a tournament. But it's back now. It is in Bozeman, Montana, which is a beautiful little city. The first SkyCon was at the Big Sky Ski Resort, and everybody kind of went up there. But that was kind of tough to get to. You live and you learn. This one is 11 minutes from the airport. It's um, it's at a it's at a hotel called the Country Inn and Suites, and it's it's easy to get to. And so SkyCon, I like to think of SkyCon as just it's sort of like a West Coast carnage. It's a beautiful place. It's meant to be really fun. It's not super stressful. And I just want people to, to enjoy their time when they come and play and still play some very high quality diplomacy. It'll be three rounds, two rounds on Saturday, one round Sunday morning that's timed. Okay. And would you say that making sure everyone has a good time is your primary objective? That is our primary objective. A lot of people are who have already committed to attending are making it more of a, a vacation for themselves. Um, it's August 23rd to the 25th, if I didn't mention that. A lot of people are extending that before and after to do some, you know, some things in and around this, this area of the country that's really, you know, breathtakingly beautiful and has a lot of, a lot of things to offer for any, any type of interest you might have. And I think the primary thing that I know SkyCon for is that when Brandon Fogel went five years ago, he had hair. That's the main thing I he remember. He did. He did. He did. Yeah. I don't so, know if the two are related because he did miss second place by a very, very narrow margin. You know, he's he's missed other things by a narrow margin, but I, but I digress. I digress. <laughs> uh, I remember at SkyCon when I went there, one of the restaurants we went to had a really great uh, Bloody Mary where there was the vodka, but then there was a frozen celery ice cube and a frozen tomato juice ice cube. I, I don't even know what the word is because I'm just like <laughs> so quirkily creative, but it was excellent. Well, let's stick with you for a minute, Alex. You know, the Boston Massacre has a long tradition as part of the North American diplomacy tour. So tell us a little bit about that history, if you would. 
Sure, I know that it, um, I, be I believe it started with Melissa Call, uh, but I wasn't really involved then, so I'm only sort of hearing that. I don't really have any experience with how she ran it, but obviously she ran it well enough and long enough that when she left, um, it eventually fell to Randy Lawrence Hurt. I'm sure that there was some, uh, some people in the middle who I am unfortunately forgetting. Uh, and then he moved down to to the Carolinas, either north or south, and it fell to me, and I've been running it for the past uh, three years. So it's been going around, along for a long time, um, and we're glad to keep it going. And I definitely did not mention the dates of it, so now's probably a good time. If you want to be part of the tradition of the Boston Massacre, uh, we're going to be August 9th, 10th, and 11th. So about two weeks before Skycom. Yeah. For those scoring, I'm going to both. I can do both, and I'm running one of them. I'm sure you guys can do it. <laughs> well, for those scoring at home, Ray Lawrence Hurt moved to North Carolina. Nobody yeah. in the right mind, nobody in the right mind would move to South Carolina. But it's Randy. Right. We don't know what mind he's in. Well, I, you know, he's not he's not far gone <laughs> enough to where he wants mustard in his barbecue. That is a joke for Carolina people. I now realize <laughs> that that's talking about South Randy, Carolina in a negative and derogatory way. All right, let's move on. Matt Manus, the Regatta is one of the projects for the Armada, which is your local diplomacy club there in that in that uh, Denver Boulder area. Tell us about the history of the Armada group itself, and about other games and projects that you do. Ah, uh, sure. Um, I formed the Armada way back in the 90s after I started becoming a traveling player when I started meeting people like you as I went around the ter different tournaments and realized that, you know, I, I bet there's people like this here in Denver. So I started looking around and found them. And sure enough, we started what we called the Armada. There for the first few years, we were just playing email games. So although we were local, we really never saw each other. But it was, in fact, I think it was at DixieCon there in North Carolina. There we go. Where um, you and Eddie Brisson and others kind of convinced me that what was missing on the tournament circuit was a Denver stop. Uh, people didn't want to go all the way to the East Coast, all the way to the West Coast every time. They want to stop in the middle and see the mountains. And next thing you know, I'm using the Armada as a way to organize uh, the regatta, which I think the first regatta was in 1999. We had five or six of them before, like I say, I took my time off to tend to the kids. Um, <clears throat> so the Armada is back now running the regatta, hoping to once again host things like DipCon and World DipCon like we did during those first few years. Uh, we do have more than just email games now for the local members of the group. We play at least twice a month. Usually we have between two to four games a month at various places here around Denver. So anybody that lives local or is traveling through, find out which... Uh, which weekend we're playing, and we'll be happy to have you get your back stabbed. Um, <laughs> the benefit of this is that I'm not trying to do it all alone in this set of Aragadas, and I have a lot of really dedicated guys with me and gals, and um, it makes the event just that much better. So we here running the Armada and in the Armada are looking forward to hosting people. That's outstanding. All right, Alex, let me come back to you for just a minute. If you had to highlight one aspect of the Boston Massacre that you would want everyone in particular to remember, what would that one aspect be? So the hotel that we have our room block on is about half a mile away from the gaming venue, and it's right down the street. And between the hotel and the venue, there are a whole bunch of different restaurants. Uh, this part of Cambridge is a real eclectic um, foodie area. It's well known for, it's got a diner, it's got uh, some Middle Eastern foods, it's got just regular American fare, it's got some clam chowder places. Um, and so it's just kind of a great place to, to go and socialize and kind of has some cool hangout places that isn't just in, in the basement of this gaming store kind of after the games are done or in like a, you know, generic hotel restaurant. And as I had said, we also have easy access into Boston, to the old State House, which is near Boston Staple Quincy Market, which has a wonderful array of, uh, of like street food and a nice feel to it. Uh, it's also near the aquarium if you're interested in that or if you bring your family and they want something to do while you're, uh, while you're kicking ass. Quincy Market is awesome, I have to say. 
How about yeah. you, Manus? Uh, tell us one thing you want us to know about the regatta, whether or not related to Eber Condrell's cooking. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we have uh, started using really big wooden boards. You can see one behind me as my background, in fact. I love so that, we yeah. We wanted to play on some pretty fancy boards, um, and not just these wooden ones. We have other great big, huge ones. We are hoping to have one that's... Uh, well, I won't even tell you, but you should come and see it. And there's um, the opportunity to go home with one of these. So we have plenty of these wooden boards, and we auction at least one off at each of these events. So come and pay $20 for your raffle ticket if you want. Buy more than one if you want, and walk home with one of these beautiful boards. So that's one thing that we do. Um, let's see. And there is Eber's Cooking, which I guess has made a name for itself in just the year that he's done it so far. So come and get some free food. Uh, that's a direct ripoff, of course, of North Carolina barbecue <laughs> that you can get at DixieCon. So make sure you get your fill of that here at the end of this month before you come out for some burgers and brats from Eber. Uh, but there's a couple things. We also have a lot of local players. So if you want a chance to play with people that you probably aren't going to get a chance to play with very often, come to Denver. Yeah, I think we saw that in the coverage last year of the regatta that we were looking at a lot of players that, you know, the rest of the hobby didn't really know. And that's fun. That's a lot of fun to, to meet with, to, to see players and to play with folks who you've never, never played with before. Um, all right, Craig. Hey, man, so, what is the, um, I, I, I just have a question. I guess you, you can cut it if you need to. Go ahead, Al. What's this ahead. auction? Like, does the money go to the club? Does it go to like some local organization? Is it just to pay for oh, the board? No, yeah, that? it's just to pay for the board. <laughs> They're not cheap. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We bought a few of them, and, and the guy that made them is holding on to them until we pay. <laughs> oh, dear. Is Out his, there, name, so is his name Matt Krill? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry, Dave. I thought that would lead more interesting. Instead, we learned about a hostage situation. Oh, that is perfectly fine. Uh, all right, Craig, tell us the top reason that folks should consider traveling to Big Sky Country for diplomacy in August. Well, I think I'll echo what Manus said about playing with new players. We have, you know, uh, uh, even though we don't have many people in Montana, we do have several um, local players who will be there. I think one that a lot of people will remember from last year is Aaron Tate. She has continued to play with us. She's the assistant uh, TD now, um, so she'll be there. Also, um, as Manus also mentioned, we are part of the Buzz Eddy Cup, and so we'll, we're the final um, we're the final event in the Buzz Eddy Cup, which I have with me right here. So this is the Buzz Eddy Cup that we talked about earlier, which is an aggregate score of the four West Coast tournaments. So it was uh, the first one was Cascadia, the second one was Whipping, the third will be Regatta, and then SkyCon is the last. And it's you know if you if you attend these tournaments and do really well, you could get your name in perpetuity upon the Buzz Eddy Cup uh, plaque. We also have amazing trophies. I think some of the best trophies there are ever that have ever been in diplomacy tournaments. And overall, it's just really fun. It's just, it's, it's not, no one's going to, you know, treat you badly. You're going to be welcomed no matter what your skill level is. It's just, it's just meant to be a fun tournament period. I should mention that Buzz Eddy, for those that don't know, was was an early organizer and big promoter of tournament diplomacy. He was a terrible diplomacy player, and I mean really <laughs> bad. Which which in the day back in the day, and he's he's left us now, by the way. He passed away years ago. Back in the day, many of the organizers, possibly most of the organizers, were themselves awful players. But in his case, Buzz was was again not good, but he was a great organizer and a great promoter and cheerleader for having different events around the country. And he was the founder of the North American Diplomacy Federation, which some people now, of course, don't know that, but he was actually the founder of the NADF. And it is great that you have a cup named after one of our, one of our trailblazers, Buzz Eddy. All right, Alex, let's conclude by talking briefly about why face-to-face -face tournaments are so enjoyable. So tell us from your point of view. Oh, I love them. So I, I, I've been playing some of the online stuff, and I think it's really great with the with the virtual um, diplomacy community is doing. I've been playing one of Alex Ronk's. Uh, I forget exactly what the tournament's called, but it's like diplomacy through time or something like that with different variants. 
I love they Barry's. Tur- they, 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 tournament, they tournament through time. The tournament through time. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I've been playing that and it's been fun. But one of the things that I miss about uh, if this was an in-person tournament is the kind of downtime, the sort of chit-chat that you would do with people where even the like common area uh, online speak is a lot of boasting and a lot of taunting and, and a lot of just like in-game sort of stuff. And there isn't there isn't really the space to just sort of hang out and chat in the way that in, uh, in person it happens real naturally, especially when the game ends and you're still there. You can't really log off. You have to go off somewhere have some dinner, might as well have it with the people uh, who you just played with or people with who played in other games, you can talk to them. It's a great opportunity to not only like really talk to people about what happened, why maybe they made the decisions you didn't understand or you made decisions they didn't understand. You can kind of talk to each other a bit more, but eventually the conversation will go to somebody else, uh, go to another topic rather. Um, okay. I don't know how to try that again without fuck, fucking over the whole thing, but... Uh, at some point, the conversation is going to turn over to another topic, and then you'll be talking about your jobs and your families and the other things that you have in common or the other dif- differences you have that are interesting. And it's a really great, great, great way to make connections with people. And I've made a bunch of friends all over the country um, that I really just know through diplomacy and who will talk to you. And it's just an excellent way to kind of meet people who you otherwise wouldn't have any contact with. You come to the hobby for the game, you stay for the people. Um, that's just the way it's always Absolutely. been. Yeah, well, Honestly. I mean, not all the people, but. No, not well, every single one. Not even all of the three of you, but two of you I really like. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, let you, I'll let you figure out later who you think who you think you are. Manus, why should folk try a face-to-face event? Not just the, the NADF events we're talking about today, but those run by other people in North America, because there are some, sure. as well as the run those run in Europe or Australia or Asia or wherever. Why should people try these? Well, Alex is definitely right that one of the things you get out of face-to-face that you're not going to get in any other uh, venue is the ability to talk about the game with people after the game in a way that uh, leads to who knows what other kind of talk. talk. And uh, uh, everyone should play face to face. Face to face is the way the game was first played. Face to face is the way the game was meant to be played. It's the way the game was invented. Everyone who's a legend in the diplomacy world started in face to face and plays face to face and will always play face to face. It is a different game. Anyone who hasn't played a face to face tournament um, should prepare themselves for some uh, stressful times, but it's so enjoyable. Everyone there is always so friendly. Um, you get things in face-to-face that you can't get in um, in electronic play, like intentional misorders. You just there's nothing like that in uh, the in, in the virtual world. Uh, come and and actually intentionally misorder something and then laugh about it with uh, your victim after the game, and uh, it's it's great. You get beer stories. You get um, and you get to meet you get to meet people, and you get a lot of new people all at once. You get to see tons of different styles. You learn so much by playing face-to-face. Um, I would say you you learn the game better if you play it face-to-face than you do uh, if you play it any other way. Why should people play face-to-face? Uh, there's really no reason not to, not to play face-to-face. And there's, as, um, as you said, there's not just the North American Diplomacy Federation uh, venue. There's Tons of, of other events going on, run by other groups. In fact, I'm playing in the World Series of Board Gaming in Las Vegas. Uh, everybody should come out to that. There's a great big diplomacy event there. Um, and that's not an NADF event, but it is going to be big. And that's in September. People should look into that. Anything around you, anything near you, anything far from you, if you can make it, any time of the year, find something to play face-to-face diplomacy and go do it. I can't recommend it any higher. I want to go back. Are you saying people intentionally misorder units? I've never heard of such a thing. I've never done it, of course. And I've, I've heard, heard of it, but I've never done it. Yeah, I've heard um, of it. I love those guys. You've heard tell of it, as we say in the South. You've heard tell of it. Yeah. But you haven't actually done it. Well, the guy telling of it looks a lot like me a lot. but oh, uh, that guy. All right, Craig, how important to the hobby do you think face-to-face tournaments are or or can be? Not just playing the game face-to-face in a club setting or 
with your friends, but in a tournament setting, how do you think that uh, is important to the hobby if it is? I mean, I think it's, it's the heart of the hobby, really. Um, you know, playing for fun, you know, on a Wednesday night down at the bar and you've got a time, you know, that's very fun. It's very fun to do. But if you really want to consider yourself good at the game, you know, being able to play at the highest level, you have to go to tournaments and you have to attend tournaments. And as far as the tournaments go, you know, I, I don't want to put a hierarchy on which tournaments are more important, but face-to-face -face tournaments, I think they're critical. I think that it's the, I, I, again, I think it's the heart of the, it's the heart of the hobby where you're face to face with someone and you're having to, you know, compete against them, navigate through these complex social interactions. It's, and I've played a lot of virtual. I love it, but face to face, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a different animal. And it, and I think in my opinion, this is my opinion, really, if you're, going to consider yourself a good diplomacy player you have to play face to face in a competitive tournament you hear that jordan connors case dismissed all right <laughs> any uh, i really appreciate you guys being on the show i more than more than that i appreciate you all putting your time and your and your money and your effort and your heart into running an event for other people to enjoy it is really how we have these events is to have people who are willing to volunteer and do that and i really appreciate that uh on behalf of everyone else in the hobby. So thank you all very much and see you around the next diplomacy tournament. Thanks to all of you watching at home. We hope you have enjoyed this broadcast of Deadline. If you have news, ideas for features or feedback of any kind, feel free to send us an email to dip, info at diplobn.com or you can drop me a line directly using davidhood at dixicon.com. To review all of our broadcast offerings, visit our website, www.diplobn.com. This is David Hood signing off. I wish you brightness and bliss and, of course, Belgium. <laughs>